caring less <laughs> has worked for me. Like rather than being a basket case about, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. I've just, I've really gone into the whole thing with this attitude that if it's meant to be, it will be. And if it's supposed to work, it will work. And you know, if I wake up tomorrow when I have to get a full-time job to pay my rent, then that is what I'll do. But it has not happened yet. Hello and welcome back to the Hannah Franklin podcast. On today's episode, my guest is Aquina Bree. Aquina is a full-time freelance writer. She is a graduate of many different education modalities. She attended public school, charter schools. She was homeschooled. She skipped college to build a freelancing business. And she just released her debut novel. Aquina is also one of my dearest friends. And I am so excited to have her on the podcast and for all of you to get to meet her too. In today's episode, we talk about what it was like growing up, bouncing between lots of different kinds of schools. We talk about how she discovered her love of writing and why she decided to make writing a novel a core part of her high school experience. We talk about what it was like to skip college to build a freelance business. And we talk about the actual story that she tells in her novel, what the writing and editing process was like, how the story evolved, and how in some ways it's a direct reflection of the experience she had growing up from her high school years into her early adulthood. Aquina shares a lot of personal details in this conversation about her experience growing up with a very tailored and alternative education. And she talks about the through lines between the education that she had and the work that she does now and the art and the writing that she's put out into the world. And I hope that you find hearing her story both interesting and hopefully useful. Aquina Bree, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Aquina Bree, a published novelist. We finally, finally get to say that now. How does it feel to have a novel out in the world? A little surreal, but good, like freeing. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so much I'm excited to get into with you today. I'm so excited to talk about your unusual education journey. I'm so excited to talk about your unusual career journey as a startup person, as a freelancer, as a writer. Um, I'm really excited to get into the story of how you wrote your book. But I want to start with the education stuff because this is what sets the stage for everything else that you have done. You were anything but conventionally educated. Um, can you talk a little bit about your education background? Yeah, for sure. So for starters, my mom was a speech pathologist, according to her degree. And so she worked in uh, mainly schools in New York as a teacher. Um, and she didn't have a particularly high opinion of the education system at large um, wasn't a fan of the bureaucracy or uh, just the way parents either were or weren't involved in their kids' education. And so she knew she wanted to do it differently with her own kids. Um, but it took us a little while to get started. There were years when I was in public school and I had a brother in charter school and another brother in like a private preschool. And we just kind of bounced around per year, um, deciding what was best for each kid that year. Um, it was never a decision that my parents just made. They always ran it by us. They asked us like what we would prefer, what would be better for our schedules. I personally took a lot of dance classes at very strange hours of the day. By the time I was in middle school, I was training to be a professional ballerina. And so I had these awkwardly placed dance classes at like noon on a Tuesday. And it's very hard to be in public school if you have a class at noon on a Tuesday. So uh, <laughs> by the time I was in high school, I was I was fully homeschooled. And 
Um, my mom was not a super hands-on homeschool parent. She didn't have to be. She had fairly self-motivated children. So I would pitch my own school year to her. I'd say, yes, I will do the math that I am, you know, legally required to do. And I will do the history that I'm legally required to do. But also, I would like to do my own writing. And so most of the novel actually was written uh, initially on Tuesday afternoons after my Tuesday dance class. I called them Writing Tuesdays. And my mom just let me sit for hours and work on this book. And that was... She's like, honestly, I think it's harder than any writing curriculum I could give you. So just go for it. <laughs> and it was it was the best year. I, I think I did that for a couple of years. I had that same dance class and that same Tuesday routine. And it was my favorite thing. And it was not a traditional education experience by any means, but it did get me here. So what was it like to be bounced between different schools and modalities every year was that hard on you as a kid was it just what you knew and it felt normal or was it a little weird to be moving social groups and environments and like never knowing what next year was going to look like honestly I never thought twice about it I thought it was very strange that people just stayed in one school for years at a time with the same people and the <laughs> same teachers. Like, it seemed very boring to me, maybe a little more stable, but quite boring. And I mean, there was a point when I went to public school for first grade, and then I went to a charter school for second grade. And then went back to the same public school for third grade. And I had the same teacher there that I had in first grade. Like, same teacher, a whole bunch of my same classmates that I'd had in first grade. And it just felt very, like, here we are again. Not not like something <laughs> was terribly wrong. Just, like, guess this is how it is this year. Um, <laughs> I thought it was kind of fun. Like, I don't know. It was, like, it was just very familiar um, the charter school that I went to multiple years was always the same school, always the same general vibe. We wore uniforms there. So it was very like rote. We just, you got up, you put on the same clothes and you went to school. Um, and by the time I was purely homeschooled, it was so just ingrained in me to get up and do the work as fast as I could so I could get on with my life. It just felt very normal. <laughs> Did it balance out as you got older? Like, did your mom start to have clearer hypotheses around, oh, this is what's best for this child. This is what's best for this child. Because you mentioned your brothers were always bouncing around, too. Or was it always as changeable all the way through? I think by the time we were all in high school, she had a pretty good idea of what worked best for everybody. So homeschooling was definitely best for me, again, given the dance schedule and what was best for my brother was more of an in-person, like he wanted to be in school. It was still more of a non-traditional, more entrepreneurial based education, but it was technically public and he did go every day. Um, so that was what was best for him. He likes being around people. And then for my other brother, he was, he wanted to be homeschooled. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to build stuff with his hands, which is not a super frequent thing in traditional education. He learns best with his hands. So for all of us, it was slightly different, but we did get there by the time we got to high school. It just took a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you were a child for most of this, but did you have a sense of what the things were that your mom was optimizing for when she was moving you between schools? Like, did you have some sense of what she was picking up that made her think, ah, maybe this isn't the best school for Aquina. Maybe I'm going to send her to a charter school next year instead. And also how involved in the process were you? Like, were you invited into the conversations about what was going to happen? Or were you just kind of told this is what you're doing next year? And you were like, okay. Yeah, I think it was a little different for all of us. But for me, I, I made it very clear that I did not enjoy going to school. I did not enjoy getting up and going to sit in the classroom. I didn't enjoy the uniforms. I did not enjoy the homework. Most of it felt 
incredibly invaluable to me. <laughs> um, there were there were select cases where that was not true. I had an incredible sixth grade experience. I had a teacher I loved who just, she pretty much let me do whatever I wanted. Um, what kind of school was that? That was a charter school. Okay. Um, so she she figured out pretty early on that I loved to write. And so if she assigned like, we're going to write essays, they need to be one page, I'd be on my way out the door and she'd be like, you can write more than one page, but I'm only going to grade the first one. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that made it so much more fun. Like I could, I could really write. And honestly, like even if she only graded the first page, she gave me feedback on whatever I gave her. And it just... By the end of my sixth grade year, I was a completely different person and writer. And so there were like, there were select cases like that where I was very, very happy to be in school. But in general, the whole routine of it, the whole like forced interaction with people my age who I just, I didn't have a lot in common with. I I got my social interaction mostly in dance class. I didn't feel like I needed it in school. Um homeschooling was just I made it very clear to my parents that that is what I wanted to do and they were very receptive to that um but I think ultimately they optimized for something different in all of us my brother wanted the social interaction of a more traditional go every day kind of school so that is what he got and we just we flowed like that how did your love of writing evolve through this process? Because you mentioned your sixth grade teacher being very formative. You also talk about during high school having your writing Tuesdays, which frankly sound idyllic. Um, I want writing Tuesdays. <laughs> I want them back. <laughs> <laughs> but how did the way you were educated affect, if at all, your love of writing? Because sometimes it's very easy to go in a classroom and someone's making you write things that you really don't care about and you forget that it can be fun. Um, do you feel like you ran into places that challenged your love of writing? Um, and if you did, what are the biggest things that you felt like nurtured it and kept it not just intact, but thriving to the point that you wrote a novel in high school? Yeah. Uh, I think there were a few things at play. I really didn't know that I loved writing until I was in second grade. So I was in a charter school that year and we were assigned short stories. Everybody had to write a short story. I think they only had to be like a paragraph. And I think mine was probably in the realm of like five pages. <laughs> I just loved it. Like it was so, it felt so empowering to sit down and come up with my own story with my own characters. and. At that point, I did not have this like gray fear of public speaking. So my teacher was like, who wants to read their story in front of the class? And I was like, oh, hell yes. So I stood up there and I read my story of the class. And it was like, I was like, wow, I could feel like this forever. Like, this is all I have to do. I just have to be a writer and it's going to feel like this every day. So <laughs> that, was, that was my like eye opening. Aha, this is what I want to do moment when I was all of seven years old. and. Sixth grade just like turned me into somebody who could actually do it. And seventh grade was much harder. I was still in the charter school. I had a new teacher, very, very new classmates, and we did not have the same sort of camaraderie, really. Um, so I was a little distraught over the fact that I felt like a lot of the things we were writing were not as fun as they were in sixth grade. And I didn't have the same sort of relationship with my teacher where I could be like, I know this is what you assigned, but also this is what I want to do. So can I do that instead? Um, so there definitely were moments as I'm like regurgitating things I've learned from Shakespeare where I was like, I don't know that this is really what I had in mind for writing. Um, <laughs> but through all of that, like seventh grade was when I really started digging into the novel. So I would have my writing Tuesdays. I would have weekends. I'd have, you know, when my homework was finished, I would sit down and I would work on the novel. And something about being able to have the creative freedom to do that kept the fire alive, even though the stuff I was actually required to write was quite miserable. Tell me about being a pre-professional ballerina. What was that like? Being a ballerina is... Uh, 
very, very hard. <laughs> and I learned this um, in free pro in honestly just the most incredible environment ever. I loved my teachers and my choreographers and my friends. And it just, it it felt like a family. The studio felt like a home. It was someplace I could go after a long day of whatever else was happening and just move. And it did not take me very long to figure out that doing it professionally was really not what I wanted. And then that kind of got taken off the table for me when I was, I think, 16. I got tendonitis in both of my Achilles. And that was it for my <laughs> uh, professional aspirations. But something that I took with me past dance was just this love for storytelling in general. Um, I I didn't see for a long time the through line between ballet and writing, but ultimately it's it's the storytelling. And I have never super cared how I get to do that, whether it was on stage or on paper. They feel very similar to me. And in fact, I, I ran an experiment, I think, when I was a senior in high school. I decided I wanted to start taking piano lessons to see if it also felt the same, if art is just art across the board and we're all just storytelling and it all feels very similar. And it did. Like, by the time I could actually play through an entire song, I was like, wow, this is exactly the same feeling as dancing and writing. When you're just in the flow with something, it is the same feeling. So I'm sure that more left-brained people also experience that flow state with whatever they're doing, but I have never experienced that. It's always been more artistic, creative stuff that has taken me there. And that is really what I took away from dance, even if it wasn't a professional career or something I was meant to do forever. Um, it did. It taught me so much about what I do now. So the novel, you say right in the description of the novel, I believe, that it was rewritten multiple times. Um, three, I believe, completely. Uh, so it is not the same thing that was born while you were doing your writing Tuesdays after dance class. Where did the story start? Like how... I'm so excited to get into this, the evolution of a novel. Where did the idea first come from? What did it look like at its inception? Maybe we can fill in what it looks like now just for context, or maybe we can get there later in the conversation. I trust wherever you want to take this. But what was that first novel that you sat down to write when you were in high school? And also, why did you decide to write a novel? Yeah. So, I mean, for starters, I did not sit down to write a novel I sat down to write a story because it was in my head and I had never finished like a long form project before I'd written a lot of short stories. And I also had a lot of unfinished, like this could be something someday, but it's not really right now and I'm out of ideas. So like, we're just going to shelf it. I think all writers have that. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea for it came to me, I think sitting in the passenger seat of my parents' car, um, I just... I had this vision of a couple of characters who were sitting by this pond that shows up nowhere in the book, never did, never showed up, just these two characters. And I was like, oh, I want to meet them, I want to figure out what they're about. And so I sat down to write a book about a woman who could communicate with the wind. And I've always been very inspired by nature and the natural world and this just felt like a good starting point for a story that I could do something with. Um, didn't really expect it to go much of anywhere. And here we are 12 years later. So <laughs> some things just pan out when they're supposed to. But <laughs> yeah, it took me a solid, I would say, year to write the first draft during my writing Tuesdays and random other moments I had. And I lost about 80 pages of the first draft to a laptop virus that just wiped out everything. So I I had to start over. Um, but it was it was such a phenomenal experience just to 
write something longer than I had ever written before and have to like fill in space that I hadn't had to fill before. And I remember emailing my sixth grade English teacher who had so helped me and just being like, I have this finished thing. What do I do with it now? And I thought that the response was going to be something along the lines of, well, let me see it because that's what she had done with a lot of my work thus far. And instead, she was like, I think you should open a new document and write it again. And I was like, that is so not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> I I just wrote it. I don't want to write it again. Um, but it it wound up being so freeing to just like have this finished thing, but also open this brand new document. And again, I just took another year of writing Tuesdays and other random moments and rewrote it. And it doubled in length. I filled in the plot holes. I adapted the characters to the world I had created, knowing more about the story, knowing more about what I wanted to do with it. I was able to really expand on it and flesh it out and make it something that I would want to read. Um, and that took that took another year. So that was draft two. And then I let it sit for a while because sometimes you just need a break from the thing that you've dumped a couple of years of your life into. <laughs> and when I came back to it, I had a completely new writing style and fresh eyes. And I knew that it could be more than it was at that moment. And that was around the time that I joined Praxis. And I was about five months into the program when I pitched it to TK Coleman. I was like, I instead of creating a value proposition this month, which is what I was supposed to be doing, I was like, I want to find an editor for my novel. I want to pitch it to her and find out like if it has legs. And he said, go for it. So that is what I did. I took about a week. It took me to find an editor who I really liked and felt like I could trust. And our styles were very similar. She just she was just a yes. So I went ahead and started working with her. And that was the third draft of the book. I rewrote it based on her feedback. She had given me some very concrete just notes on character development and where the story was currently versus where it could be. She was like, you have like 30,000 words you could add to this and just like make it the thing that you want it to be. She's like, I can tell you're so close and it just like hasn't gotten there yet. And I'm 18 years old at this point. This is really the first time in my life that I have the kind of experience required to write the story that I knew it could be. So I did. I sat down and and rewrote it. And then I did another round of edits with her and rewrote the final act a fourth time because I knew it was not where I wanted it to be. And it was so close. So three drafts total, four drafts at the end. Um, and it finally became the thing that I wanted it to be, the thing I knew it could be all along. But you're not 18 anymore. <laughs> no, it's I been a while since you did the third rewrite. What happened next? So there was a gap where I let it sit because I was deciding whether I wanted to uh, self-publish or pitch it to agents. And I was very up in the air about this for a couple of years. And then I also had a very rough um, personal couple of years where I just did not even have time to think about this. So it did a lot of sitting collecting dust metaphorically on my laptop and <laughs> when that you know rest period was over um I was talking to one of my teachers and he was saying with great certainty like it's time to let this go you can do it like <laughs> it's time for it to be out in the world and I was like how do you know and he was like I can feel it and he was like can't you feel it and I sat there and I was like yeah, I guess I can. And that was about, <laughs> that was a little less than a year ago. So I have been, I have been in it ever since, just getting it ready to send out into the world. Um, just smaller things, giving it, you know, finalizing the title, 
giving it a cover, making sure that like all of the people I wanted to include in the acknowledgements were in there, um, which they're absolutely not. I could have named every single person in my life because it's been a 12 year <laughs> project, but I did my best. Um, it's, it's so weird to have it be finished. And also I never doubted that it would get here once I decided that that's what I wanted to do. Today's episode is brought to you by the John Galt Mortgage Company. I promised myself when I started the show that I was never going to have a sponsor unless I could truly endorse what they are doing. And that could not be more true for the John Galt Mortgage Company. My friends, Mitch and Tim, started the company earlier this year after working in the real estate world for years and realizing that mortgages are way more expensive than they need to be. Most real estate agents don't actually know how much extra profit is baked into the cost of a mortgage. So Mitch and Tim started a new kind of mortgage, one where they cap their own profits on every transaction and pass the savings along to you, the buyer, in the form of a lower interest rate. If you are in the market for a house, I absolutely recommend checking out what Mitch and Tim are doing. You can find more at www.johngaltmortgage.com or you can find the link below in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. How much did the story change from the first draft that you wrote when you were how old? I think I was 13 when the first draft was Okay, done. the first draft that you wrote at 13 to the final draft that you wrote at 18 to the edited version that is going out into the world now. Are there even pieces of it that are the same besides the characters and like the rough story or like are there entire passages that have remained intact or is the whole thing like a new book? This is a good question and I think about it a lot because I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> I think most of the first, like, it's split into three parts. And a solid chunk of the first part is very similar to what it was when I was 13. The language is different. It's stronger. But the basic plot is the same. Once you get further into part two and certainly part three, nearly everything is different. I think everything in part three is different than it was before. Um, most of it is the same as it was when I was 18. There were a couple moments, um, just like intermittent editing when I was in my very early twenties where I would be like, this scene needs to be slightly different. And I think there needs to be a new scene here and I maybe don't need this one, but across the board, the end has been mostly the same since I was 18. How do you feel like you and the book grew up together? Like, I imagine as you're going through the tumultuousness, which is adolescence, and as you're entering into adulthood, your perspective on the world changes quite a bit. Your grasp of stories and their flow changes quite a bit. Um, how do you feel like those things went, worked in tandem? Because I imagine like working on the book also affected you quite a bit. Yes. I love this question. <laughs> so the book has four major themes. And I think I uncovered a different one of them every time I rewrote it. So there is an element of the book where the main character is being forced to leave the only home she's ever had, only home she's ever known. And to her, it is this great inconvenience and stressor. And in fact, it is giving her her freedom. And I did not put this together until I rewrote it the first time. I was like, wow, this is so good for her. She gets to be free. She gets to go find out who she is outside the confines of her regular, <laughs> normal life. And I think at that point, I was, I was probably 14. I was craving that kind of experience, just of like experiencing a, a freedom I had not known before. I had a very rigid, like 
this is when I do my schoolwork. This is when I go to dance class. I'm at dance class for four hours and then I go home and go to bed and I'm exhausted and I'm, and I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Like that's it. Um, so writing the book gave me a certain level of freedom just because I got to almost like live vicariously through these people I had created. <laughs> um, so there was, there was that. And then the second theme that kind of unraveled with time was this idea that you can choose your family. And to be clear, I grew up in a wonderful family. I never felt like I needed another one. Um, again, my my dance friends felt like family. I grew up choosing my people and loving them and also just like having them put in front of me. Like, here are these people who you're going to adore forever. And just never had a problem with it, but I I didn't know how important that was going to be to the story until I realized that's what was happening. I was like, oh, she has her freedom and she gets to choose her family. And yes, they are blood related to her, but she had never met them before. So now she's here with her aunt and her uncle and her cousin, and she gets to experience life in a new way with these people. And, and this is her new family. So that unraveled. And beyond that, I I moved a lot as a child. We moved just about every year. And usually within like a few miles of the last house, um, I did move across the country three times, I think, before I turned 12. So there was some like major back and forth. But I always kind of wondered what it felt like for people to just have like one steady home, similar to like the idea of like some kids just stay at the same school forever like that's so weird i had this thing where i was like kids just grow up in one house but i wanted that like contrary to the school issue where i was like that seems really boring i was like wow it would be really nice to just like unpack and just stay unpacked forever <laughs> um <laughs> so i kind of over time as that became more important to me it integrated itself into the book in ways that uh felt very natural where the main character is choosing her her freedom and her family but also her home she's like this is this is my place this is where i want to be planted this is what's important to me and it felt very pertinent in my own journey to have that in there so that was the third thing. And the final thing to unravel was like what felt like the point of the book and the thing that I had been building up to and just not quite grasping because I hadn't figured it out for myself yet. But it's this question of whether or not people are intrinsically good. So you have this, this girl who can communicate with the wind. It's this very powerful thing, but it's also deeply frowned upon by people who are very close to her. And so she spends a lot of time grappling with this idea that like, maybe this makes her a bad person or a danger to society. Like this is something that people are giving her looks about. So like, maybe it's her. And it's a fictional way to kind of look at, are people intrinsically good? Are they intrinsically evil? Does it matter? Um, and it is something that I grappled with myself as a child just based on the way I was raised I I very frequently wondered like are we good do we do we, is there something we need to be saved from do we need to save other people from something and uh that is what the book unpacks over over the course of um you know I think it's like 33 chapters um are we good does it matter in tandem with writing your book did you study the art of writing novels? Like, how did you learn how to do this? And was it a very, I'm guessing by the way you've talked about this, that it was a very self-directed process, but I'm curious what it looked like. Or did you just read a lot and then you sat down and you're like, okay, I've read a book. Like, I know how to write one. I did a lot of reading as a child. It was outside of dancing. It was my number one hobby. I loved it. And... I had read particularly a lot of fantasy novels, which is what mine is. Um, and so it it just felt very natural to one day sit down and be like, I can do this. But like people do this every day. <laughs> 
I love that. And that was literally it. You weren't ever like, I'm going to go read books on writing or I'm going to go like study plot structure or anything like that. You were just like, this is in me. I can do this. And then you did. I have read very few books on writing. I honestly, I find them very boring. I think it's very sad that there's like a recipe for writing a book. Um, I mean, I, I studied the hero's journey and how that, you know, progresses, but that was more like I had to do that for work. Um, I was writing podcast scripts at a certain point and we were using the hero's journey as a template and I found it very restrictive, which is why I don't use it myself. But like <laughs> in studying those things, it, I that's what I learned. I was like, okay, well, this one's not for me. The most value I've really gotten out of um, a book on writing, so to speak, uh, probably came from Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic, um, mm. which is really kind of fluffy. Like, it's a beautiful book, and I love it, but it doesn't have this, like, and this is exactly how your creative process should be. It's more like you can you can do what works for you. You can write the book that you want to write. You can make the movie you want to make. And I was like, yeah, everybody should think like this. <laughs> You're being creative. You literally get to be creative and make it yes. up. Yes. I find that really interesting, actually. As you know, I was also a very bookish and uh, writerly, I'm totally making up words now, little kid um, and teenager. I also spent my middle and high school years with writing being my favorite thing to do for me. I didn't have like a day of the week, but I had like a time slot in the day where I didn't have my own computer yet. And so I had to use my mom's and she did a really great job sort of like setting sort of guardrails around just like practically. It's like we're doing other things before lunch and then I don't need my computer after lunch, but then later in the afternoon, I'm going to need it to do things. So you have this very finite window, just logistically speaking, within which to write. And I found very quickly that I preferred writing on the computer because I liked being able to work non-linearly. It really bothered me to have to like I'd finish a paragraph and I'd be like, but I forgot a sentence in the middle. Like there's something else I want to say. And so it would get very messy very fast and like working non-linearly, just like really I could write like a piece of a scene here and a piece of a scene here and then do the through lines later and just like sketch it all out. Um but I loved reading about the craft of writing. There was this uh, children's and YA fantasy author named Gail Carson Levin. She wrote Ella Enchanted and The Princesses of Bemer and a few other really amazing fantasy books for kids. Um, and she had a blog where every Wednesday she would answer a reader question. So you could ask her questions in the comments and then you'd get so excited when she'd write a blog post answering your question. Um, but every week she would write a piece on writing and she would write about like, you know, you'd ask a question about character development or like designing a scene or like how like I'm writing the story and like my character, like I can't like make these characters like through th threads actually work. And like, how do I fix it? And she also had this really great book called Writing Magic that was about writing for like teenagers who wanted to write. There was another one called Spilling Ink. I'm trying to remember the names of the authors who wrote that one. It was two women. Um, but my mom did a really great job finding these for me. And then I just like ate them up like they were candy. I just loved them. My my copies are in tatters. Um, and I feel like even that's like an important juxtaposition that like you can love the craft of writing and love it for very different reasons or love it in very different ways and I love that you didn't want to do any of that. Like, it just felt like a no for you. And yet you're, you've published your novel. Like, clearly, clearly it worked. I love that. I love that we had such different experiences, but also, like, it, a love of writing is a love of writing. Mm -hmm. A love of story mm -hmm. is a love of story. To your point earlier, I think that really is, is the through line. Um, is it scary to publish a novel? Like, how do you know it's ready? Um, I have asked myself this a lot as well. And <laughs> I, I keep coming back to this. Um, I think it was 
maybe an interview that I watched with Mary H.K. Choi. She wrote a couple of my favorite uh, contemporary novels. Um, she talks about how she always knows she's done with a project when she's making edits and then unmaking them because it was better before. I finally hit that point where I was like, I think I'm making it worse instead of better. <laughs> And that was just not acceptable to me. I was like, oh, it is done. So I also like I did a blog post and interviewed a bunch of creative friends and was like, how do you know when stuff is done? And they all said different things. We all have different crafts. But like there is there is a point where you're making it worse instead of better. So I did hit that point. And at that point, I was like, we're done. But it is scary. Like. I would say a solid decade of my life is like woven into these 399 pages of text. And so you're kind of just like putting your, in, at least for me, it's like putting my entire growing up on display for everybody to read. Everybody's like, is the book about you? I'm like, no, but undercover, like a lot of it is, is just stuff that I went through and have fictionalized. So it's, it is a little scary, but mostly at this point, I think I've gotten past like the hurdle where it was really terrifying. And I'm mostly just in this place of, oh, thank God it's done. <laughs> you aren't just a novelist. You also write professionally in other capacities. You've built a business as a writer. Um, I want to talk about this side of the story, too. So you... We're a pre-professional dancer, got double tendonitis, sounds awful. Um, that dream got shelved. You'd written your novel. Um, what happened next in the chronological story? Because you made an interesting set of choices that sent you down the career path that you're currently on. And I want to go down the rabbit hole of how we got here. Yeah. So when I was 12, the same year that I did my sixth grade, I'm going to be a writer. I remember I was on a family road trip, like in the back seat, having a mini heart attack. Like it just hit me all of a sudden. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to finish school. And then there's going to be more school. I'm going to have to go to college and get a degree. I'm going to have four more years of this stuff. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. Like it was just all hitting my little 12 year old self. I was like, I can't do this anymore. There were things I wanted to do. Like I was so past this. So I, <laughs> I just sat in the back seat and I was like, mom, she was like, yes. I was like, do I have to go to college? And she burst out laughing. She's like, is there something you need a degree for? I was like, I don't know. And my dad was like, do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be a lawyer? I was like, no. They were like, then probably not. Like, <laughs> you, They were like, you can go to college if you need a degree for something. But like, it is not encouraged. My my parents went to, um, I think, like the number one party school in New Hampshire. That's like that was their college experience. And they both transferred at different points. And my dad did end up graduating from that original school. But they did not have these like glowing college experiences that would indicate that you actually need one. So I was very fortunate to have to just be jumping in with parents who were like not on board with that anyway. <laughs> um, so when I was still in high school, my mom heard about Praxis. And I know you've had a bunch of Praxis people on the podcast, so people are familiar, but the praxis experience for me felt a little out of reach because I was like I don't know that I'm like a startup person I think I might be a little artsy for this <laughs> <laughs> really quickly mm -hmm. some people will probably be listening to this who aren't familiar with praxis mm -hmm. um I've had their now CEO on the show I've had their founder on the show so there have been a couple of conversations about this but for the uninitiated can you very quickly expand on what it is yeah. So Praxis is, I think it's currently a year-long program. It's um, based on 
opting out of college and instead participating in more of an apprenticeship type experience or just like real world job experience. It's really great for entrepreneurs. Um, I would happen to know. So uh, that was that was what I was going into was something just very non-traditional, something I knew like my grandparents were probably going to frown upon. Like this was a this was a leap that I was willing to take, but I honestly thought that I was too artsy for it. Um, but after going through the interview process and talking to a bunch of people on the team, I was like, you know what? I think like, I think this is for me. I think I can do this. So I did Praxis and did my six month apprenticeship with a company out in California. I worked remotely from Colorado and I was doing a lot of podcast scripts and SEO pieces it's where I learned what I now know about SEO. And I was sending a newsletter out once a day to about half a million people, which was very intense. Every time I hit the send button, I was like, this feels wrong. <laughs> there's, I'm sure there's something in here that we need to change. But it was it was an incredible like first career experience to have had. And when my six-month apprenticeship was complete, I was like, you know what? I think it's time for me to do my own thing. Like, I want to be a freelancer. I want to just, like, do this for myself. It felt much more aligned for me personally. And I never had a moment of like, this is going to be hard or I can't do this because both of my parents were entrepreneurs. This worked out very well for me. <laughs> they were never like, that's really hard and you shouldn't do it or you need a full-time job to survive in the world. It was always very like, you're going to have to do what works best for you. And if that's starting your own business, like you should know that it's not easy, but it is not impossible. So I did not have this view that it was going to be something that I couldn't do. So you start your business, which you are still running to this day. You do freelance writing and editing for a number of different clients. So you have made writing your full-time career on top of being a novelist, which I imagine is freeing because it allows you to put your art out into the world without being like, I have to make it as a novelist, which sounds very scary. Yeah. Um, it's like J.K. Rowling or bust. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, what's it like being a full-time freelancer with your own business now that you've been at it for a while? It's what I wanted. It's the only thing I wanted to do. I past the point where I was willing to be a professional ballerina, I just wanted to write. So I was willing to rack up experiences at the beginning that I maybe was not like overly excited about, but I knew that any experience was good experience. And at a certain point, I did transition into more editing specifically because it is copywriting is hard. Um, <laughs> writing for clients is hard. There's an element of it where the more experience you have, the easier it is. But like, I did not have a ton of experience going into it. So the editing allowed me to learn a whole bunch about what people were looking for. And then I went back and started getting back into the writing aspect of it, which has been just so much different the second time around. Um, it's it's, it's hard to describe. Like, it's so much fun to write for a whole bunch of different people in a whole bunch of different voices. I do a lot of ghost writing now, so they're like, they're wildly different voices. But it's also, it's the type of thing you have to be prepared for going into it because you give a lot. Like, it's, it's a lot to sit down and write 2,000 words a day. Um, but it also feels like, I, I like to work with clients where I feel like I am helping somebody <laughs> versus just like cranking out marketing copy I want to feel like it's making a difference and having an impact and that is it keeps you on a trajectory like it keeps you going to know that you are making a difference for either someone else's business or their mission or their vision so 
those are the clients I love to work with. But yeah, it's been it's been crazy. It's been, it has been a journey to get here. <laughs> you basically spent almost all of what would have been your college years running your own business, right? Yes. Because you did your you did practice, you did your apprenticeship for six months, but then the other three years of what would have been college, if my math is correct, correct me if I'm wrong, you basically were full time freelancing and have continued doing that since. Is there anything that you feel like you missed by having like not having a traditional experience? Or is there anything that's been like challenging in building your business because you didn't have a traditional experience? Mm -hmm. And by traditional experience, I really just mean going to college. <laughs> yeah, I I don't feel like I missed anything, um, which is a, just a great benefit of having wonderful friends who have stuck with me through like middle school um, and just the community that I connected with in Praxis, like that sticks with you forever. So I did not feel like I missed something Um and I definitely don't feel that I would be in a better spot career-wise if I had gone to college. I think I would be behind <laughs> like where where I am now. I, I could not have gotten all of this done or set up or learned all of these things without actually getting my hands in it and just getting started. And that's kind of the beauty of writing is that in order to like, in order to feel the magic of it and really like participate in it you just have to do it it's not enough to go learn about it it's not even it's not even enough to sit down and read like you have to be able to sit down and do the writing and suck at it so that you can get better later <laughs> so I could not have had you know four years of professional writing experience had I gone to college to sit down and write essays How does building a business work in practice? Like you spent the last few years building a network and that network has led to opportunities coming your way. But how did you actually build a client base? Because I think that's one of the things that scares people when they're thinking about building a business. There's obviously like the whole like logistical side of actually setting up a business that can be very intimidating there's the like actually doing the work and, you know, you're the boss. So you're kind of also the arbiter of quality. And that can be very scary. Like you don't know what you don't know. But the unknowns of being able to have clients coming through a business can be very scary. Like that's such an unknown. Um, how did that work for you? Yeah. I always say that I'm the worst person to ask about this because it's true, but I will tell you, I had the just great fortune of having all of these connections when I graduated from Praxis. Um, my first client was a Praxis advisor, and I got my next opportunity from a Praxis advisor at the company that they're with. So. It was it was kind of smaller projects building on top of one another, just with people I knew and who trusted me already. And I have been able through that, like consistent building on top of one another to create a business that grows solely based on word of mouth. Um, clients come to me. I have never had like a, oh, my God, where is my next person going to come from? Like give me my next victim like I just never had this this moment of wow this really isn't gonna work like I can't do this people just um have come to me I am so like fortunate to have worked with people who I just really connected with and so when we're done with a project if I just edited their book they're over here talking to their friend who's also an author and they're like oh I need an editor too and they're like you should work with Aquina and it's just it's all happened that way. And this is like just no piece of advice to give, but I think that caring less <laughs> has worked for me. Like rather than being a basket case about, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. I've just, I've really gone into the whole thing with this attitude that if it's, 
meant to be, it will be. And if it's supposed to work, it will work. And, you know, if I wake up tomorrow when I have to get a full-time job to pay my rent, then that is what I'll do. But it has not happened yet. It is nice when you're a freelancer, and I've definitely gone through this thought experiment too, of like knowing that you are traditionally employable. Um, like if things don't work, you can always go get a job. And that's not like the worst case scenario. I mean, that if that is the worst case scenario, you're like, okay, that's not like I can survive that. And that is very freeing because it allows you to take risks in ways that usually pan out, but you're you feel unable to take because you know you have a backup plan. But I actually love your answer to this because I think everybody loves putting their success into a formula and everybody loves listening to and following and buying things from people who can put things into formulas because we love the feeling of control. It's like, oh, I figured this out and now I can help you. Like I can be the guru on the hill. I can help you do this too. And everybody loves like, oh, somebody figured this out. If I just do what they tell me to do, I'll end up in this place too. And I think you have to be really careful with that. There are a lot of gurus on Twitter who can tell you exactly how to build your seven-figure business. And there are elements in these things that will work for you. But it's not a one-path-fits-all kind of deal. And there's no guarantee that if you do all the things and check all the boxes that you'll have the same success. There's a level of emergence and a level of sort of spontaneous synchronicity that occurs on your path when you're figuring out how to build something or how to get somewhere that you can't control for. And I've talked to so many people who've been accidentally successful, and I say accidentally in air quotes because, I mean, they showed up. They did the work. They did the things. They were in the rooms. It's not like they were just sitting on their couch watching Netflix and one day success came and knocked on the door and was like, hi, here's a million dollars. Congratulations. You won. And they're like, amazing. I made it. Now I can go tweet about how to make a million dollars, too. Um, like you, you show up and you do the thing. But I think that there are more stories than we like to admit of people who happen to build the right network or happened to tap into the right place where there was like a whole vein of gold that they could follow through client after client after client, or who, you know, hit the right momentum thread on the internet for the right people and were able to ride algorithms to get in front of the right person. Um, and so I don't think that approaching it formulaically is correct. I spent a lot of time thinking about this because I've struggled with this too as somebody who runs her own business and does her own creative things. Like, how do you know who to listen to and who not to? But I love the way that you tell your story because it's so within the realm of possibility that a young person can say, I don't want to go to college. I want to start a business. I'm just going to focus on networking or like not even intentionally networking, but like getting in rooms where it feels like there are people who can help me, but maybe I can help too and who feel aligned in their interests and their goals. And by being in those rooms, I can start to like, may maybe I will start to build connections that will lead to fruitful relationships that will actually like help me sustain my business too um i think these are the most important stories to tell and so i i love your answer to this i think there's also an element of like self-confidence too right if you think your business is going to fail it probably will but if you think it's going to <laughs> succeed it probably will <laughs> mm -hmm. also true and especially that former one like if you think it's going to fail you're going to stop taking the shots because you're scared. If you stop taking the shots, you, you can't, what is it? The, is it Wayne Gretzky? You miss 100% of the shots you don't yeah, take. Yeah. Um, I forget, really, oh, Wayne, good, good hockey guy. <laughs> um, you have to show up in order for the thing to happen. And sometimes you have to like knock on a few doors before you find the one that opens. But you have to be like, convinced that you have a chance at success if you're convinced you're going to fail 
that's probably a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, were there any things that were helpful to you in learning how to be a copywriter, a ghostwriter, a professional writer running an agency? Or was this also, it was kind of like writing the novels where you just like read a lot of things and you figured out how to do it? It was definitely a lot of reading and figuring it out. There was also just the fact that my parents had been through all of these stages of building a business before. And so I was able to kind of piggyback on their learning and organize things the way I wanted to organize them, but also like have a framework for what works. Um, but ultimately, I think it's building a business is really a lot of trial and error. Like you can get into it and find out that you're doing something you really don't enjoy, which the first time around, I, I was like, wow, copywriting is not for me. But once I had done a bunch of editing, I was like, oh, well, this is why it was not working. Now I like I understand better what people want. And so I can give them that. Um, and so the writing was much smoother from there. But I had to I had to trial run that. Nobody could tell me that I wasn't going to like it the first time. <laughs> if people have enjoyed this conversation and they've enjoyed hearing you talk about your book and they're excited to read it or they want to read more of your writing elsewhere because you are writing in other places, you have a newsletter, you write on other places on the internet, um, or they're interested in working with you as a client, where... Where would you send them next? Also, give us the pitch for the book. Like, who is it for? What is the age range? Like, should parents be buying this for their teenagers? Should people be buying it for their friends? Who's going to enjoy it? Give us give us the pitch. Yes. OK, so <laughs> we'll, we'll start with the book. The, the book was specifically written for a YA audience, so about 12 and up. Um, it is... It's a fantasy novel. So if you like magic, if you like fairy tales, um, or if you just are curious what it would be like to speak to the wind, that is who the book is for. Um, I did write it for my teenage self. Um, and so that is who I'm hoping it appeals to. I have heard that it is for all ages so far. So happy to hear that. Um, it is available on Amazon, on Apple Books, on Nook, and on Kobo. Um, and you can find me all over the internet, but, um, the easiest place to find me is at aquinabree.com. That is where all of my social links are. It's where the newsletter sign up is, where the blog is, where you can read about, um, my services and contact me. That is the best place to be. It's aquinabree.com. Aquina, it was so fun to finally have you on my podcast. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing not only your story, but the story that you crafted through your story <laughs> and about your story, um, for sharing your writing process with us, your career process with us. This has been a really fun conversation and hopefully, and I imagine it will be, helpful to families and young people and people who aren't young anymore but who wants to follow their dreams of being a writer um hopefully people find this very helpful thank you so much hannah this was so fun All right, my friends, that is a wrap for today. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope that you found this valuable. Please leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. Please like the video on YouTube. And please don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to make sure that you don't miss next week's episode. Thank you so much, friends. I will see you next week.